But now, without further ado, I uh, am going to pass the floor to Dave for the uh, introductory statement. Okay, great. I'll see if I can change any of your minds out there. Um, as you might have guessed, I am arguing the, the pro-English uh, part of this argument. I'll give the same disclaimer that Alex gave. I am here speaking in a personal capacity, and I am definitely not speaking on behalf of anyone I work for. Um, I also realize I'm an imperfect messenger to be uh, arguing the side of the equation because I am a native English speaker and it could be perceived that I'm just doing this out of laziness. Uh, even worse, I'm American, so I'm from the country that's, uh, whose cultural imperialism is responsible for the reason why we're all speaking English. Uh, I'm very aware of that, but I would like to think that if I was German or Italian or Czech, and maybe even if I was French, I would feel the same way, that, that English is actually uh, a great blessing for the European project and not a curse. Um, I want to start with a story. Shortly after I arrived in Brussels as a journalist in 2010, I was remember I was at a press conference by then Commission President Jose Manuel Barroso. I don't remember what it was on. I think it might have been something to do with the European semester, but Barroso started. He gave his whole introductory comments in English and then opened up the floor to questions. And a certain French TV journalist, who I will not name, uh, asked the first question and said, Mr. Barroso, I have a problem. You gave all your introductory remarks in English and my viewers don't understand English. Can you please say it again in French? Now, Barroso had been speaking for about 10 minutes, but he proceeded to do the entire 10 minute speech again in French. Now, I should mention that this press conference was being interpreted into all 23 official EU languages. Um, at the time, I was scandalized by this, and so were the people around me who were not native English speakers, by the way, but it was just so typical. Um, and, and this is really where I'm coming from with this issue about multilingualism, uh, and it's why I get kind of exercised about this. Um, because in my mind, when I hear the word multilingualism in this town, I hear a red herring. I hear a red herring that has been used by the French to try to reimpose the French language on people here and try to make French the working language of the European Union. And of course, in decades past, it was that really started to change starting in the 1990s, I think, with the Scandinavian entries. And then really the, the coup de grace was in 2004 with the Eastern European uh, accessions, Eastern Europeans, of course, generally don't speak French and do speak English, with the notable exception of Romania. Uh, and that really solidified English as the, the working language here. Uh, but the French never seem to, to give that up. And a lot of times in this town, when I hear people complaining about the lack of multilingualism here, it's always French people. When there's a journalist who's complaining about the fact that the commission has issued a press release only in English, it is always a French journalist. And so that's why I'm, I'm immediately suspicious of the word multilingualism uh, when it's used in this town. Um, it's, it's not to say that I'm opposed to multilingualism, but I'm opposed to multilingualism for multilingualism's sake. I think multilingualism has a place uh, in the European Union when it's useful and when it's needed. Uh, for instance, certainly for laws, everyone should be able to read EU laws in their own languages. Everyone should be able to read the main communications from the EU in their own languages. The websites of the EU institutions should be available in, in all 23 languages. But I'm against French people roaming the hallways of the European Commission and going into offices to scold people for speaking English because nobody in that office is a native English speaker. True story. I'm against certain countries not allowing their ministers who speak perfect English to speak English publicly at a conference, even though right before we went on stage, that person was speaking to me fluidly. Again, true story. I'm against the constant whinging in this town about how horrible it is that we can all communicate with each other in a common tongue. English is a blessing, and there's a reason we're all speaking it here. It's not some kind of power dynamic. It's not an accident. Before Brexit, 52% of EU citizens could speak English, either as a first language or a second language. That percentage is now down to 44% after Brexit. Only 1% of those people are native speakers, the Irish. 36% of EU citizens can speak German, first or second language, and 29% can speak French, 
18% speak Spanish or Italian. That's all according to Eurobarometer. So if you look at you know, pre-Brexit pre situation, more than half, now after Brexit, less than half will probably be back up to 50% before long. English is no longer a language. It's increasingly just an essential part of a European education if a person wants to succeed on this continent. And English isn't only the lingua franca here, it's the world's lingua franca. You guys might think that Chinese is the most spoken language in the world. It's not. English is. English is spoken by 1.27 billion people compared to Chinese, which is spoken by 1.12 billion people. For English, the majority of that proportion are second language speakers. And for Chinese, the vast, vast majority are first language speakers. So of course, that makes English uh, by far the, the more logical language out of those two to pick as a global language. The second global language is Hindi. The third is Spanish. And then French and Arabic are roughly tied. So if you look at those figures, how does it make any sense to use any other language than English as the working language of the EU after Brexit? And I would really ask, how does it make any sense to use French as the working language? Before Brexit, it was the third most spoken language in both categories, first language and second language. So that journalist asking the question in that press conference, you would ask, why didn't a German journalist demand that Barroso repeat it in German? Why didn't every journalist demand it? Why didn't Barroso have to do it in all 23 languages so we could sit there for three hours? Why does French get this special privilege when it comes to language? We know the reason. We know, we know because it's history. But I would also point out that back when French was the lingua franca of Europe, it was an elite language. It's not that half of people were speaking French before English became the dominant language. It was just the language spoken by elites, the educated, the ruling class. English is a great equalizer. Everybody is learning it now in school. People speak English across classes. Recently, there was another certain French journalist I will not name who was making the argument that English is some kind of elitist language only used in the Brussels bubble. I can tell you I spend plenty of time outside of the Brussels bubble, interacting with real people who don't know anything about the European Union and their English is great. And not just in Sweden and the Netherlands, all over in Italy and Spain and Poland. Um, so, you know, with Brexit, to make to wrap up my arguments here, there's no reason why Brexit should mean that we use English less. The predominance of English in the European Union never had anything to do with the British. It had to do with American culture, and we're going to go into that later here. Uh, now, the French always argued that the use of English gave the British an unfair advantage in EU policymaking. If that's the case, they sure as hell didn't take advantage of it, right? I mean, we always know that the English were outplayed here in this town. Uh, they never really took advantage of that. I never saw it giving them an advantage. But now they're gone. So now English is a neutral language uh, that really only gives the Irish a leg up, and, and they're a pretty small country in the European Union. Uh, it's now a language that doesn't belong to any member state. Don't forget, Ireland has notified Irish, and Malta has notified Maltese. So it's the perfect neutral language. In fact, we should be increasing the use of English in Brussels now that the British are gone, because that argument that it gives a certain country a greater advantage is gone now. Um, and finally, I would just say you know, another complaint I hear about uh, English or globish, as certain French journalists call it, is that it's become incomprehensible, that it doesn't make any sense. It makes perfect sense to me. I've lived in this town for 10 years. The type of English I speak here is different than the type of English I speak when I go home. I love Brussels English. I don't think it's a, some kind of abomination. English doesn't belong to any country anymore. It belongs to the world. It doesn't belong to America. It doesn't belong to the UK. It's now a tool for international communication, bringing cultures together. It's a fantastic thing, and I think we should embrace it.